continue our series uh, on the Sermon on the Mount uh, called The Red Letters. Matthew chapter 4 is where you'll find me this morning. Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, we'll also have it for you up here on the screen. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Hear these words of Scripture. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And Jesus healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, in 1784, a brilliant political leader, scientist, and inventor, one who would go on to have dozens and dozens of inventions and discoveries uh, credited to his name, uh, electricity uh, being one of them, began to have trouble with his vision. He began to have trouble with his vision. He would notice that when he would go to read his books, uh, the words on the page were appearing bur blurry and, and fuzzy and distorted. And not only were objects that were close fuzzy and distorted, but objects that were far away were also blurry, fuzzy, and distorted. And for this political leader, scientist, and inventor, he found himself at a crossroads because when it pertained to his physical vision, his entire life was now completely out of focus. Ah, but it was then that Benjamin Franklin came up with possibly one of his best inventions yet, the bifocal glasses. And when an individual put on a pair of Benjamin Franklin's bifocal glasses, things that were once blurry, things that were once fuzzy, now came back into focus with stunning sharpness and clarity for Benjamin Franklin and for those who put on a pair of his bifocal lenses, life went from out of focus to now being suddenly back into focus. Ah, oh, Fellowship Huntington Drive, if you get it early, I don't preach as long. I'm still going to preach long, but just not quite as long. When Jesus stands up on the Sermon on the Mount and delivers his first and most important sermon, you have to understand that what he is doing is he is giving us the spiritual bifocal lenses for the entire human experience. Jesus says... I know that you think you see God correctly. I know that you think you see this world and life and love and joy correctly, but I've got some news for you today. Your whole life and vision is entirely out of focus. That's the bad news, but the good news is the kingdom of God is here, and I've got some spiritual bifocal glasses, and I have come to adjust your vision. Look at somebody and say, let Jesus adjust your vision, boo. Oh, find somebody else. Say, let Jesus adjust your vision, boo. <laughs> Jesus looks out at his disciples, and he looks out at the crowd, and he says to the crowd and to the disciples, and those of us gathered in this room this morning, Jesus says, I know you think you see life correctly, 
but your vision is out of focus. I know you think you see forgiveness and justice correctly, but allow me to adjust your vision. Your vision is out of focus. I know you think you see marriage and love correctly, but can I adjust your vision because it is entirely out of focus. So Jesus gives us some instructions on how to live in this world. But before Jesus gives us instructions on how to live in this world, the first thing that Jesus does is he equips us to see this world correctly, to see this world the same way that God sees the world. Ah, Pastor Barbara Brown Taylor, I love it. She says it this way. She says, there are a great many people outside of the church who need saving and a great many people inside the church who need saving. And the primary thing that people inside the church need saving from is this notion that we see the world the same way that God sees it. We don't. And whether or not you've worn physical glasses a day in your life, each one of us in this room are born with a spiritual astigmatism that causes life to be seen out of focus. Astigmatism. It's just a medical term that describes when the inside of your eyeball is curved in the wrong direction. And I've come to submit to you that the same thing that can be true of the human eye is true of every single human heart in this room today. Our hearts are curved in the wrong direction. Our souls and our spiritual eyes come curved in the wrong direction. They come curved towards sin, curved towards idolatry, curved towards injustice and oppression curved towards greed, curved towards pride, and curved towards sin. And that's why we need this spiritual adjustment of our vision and why we need these kingdom lenses called the kingdom of God. We come born with a spiritual astigmatism that causes our souls and our hearts and our spiritual eyes to be pointed and curved in the wrong direction. And that's all of us in this room this morning. And you, you know how I know it's all of us? I, I decided to do, because I was like, they ain't going to believe me. They ain't going to believe me. So I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's also a pastor up in Seattle, and he did some amazing research. And I said, Aaron, can I borrow some of your research? And he said, sure, sure. And so I ran the same research project that my friend Aaron ran up in Seattle, and I went to this incredible database, this incredible resource that is an incredible tool if you ever want to study human psychology, and if you ever want to study human behavior. This is one of the best resources out there. I don't know if you've heard of this website or this app, but it's called Instagram. <laughs> and so I went to Instagram in order to research to see if we see the world the same way that God does. I wanted to see if we think the same people are blessed, because that's all Beatitudes means. It's just a fancy word for blessings. So I just wanted to see, do we see the world the same way that God sees the world? And so I researched under the hashtag blessed, and you could do this too. Not now, because I'm still talking, but <laughs> later when you go home. I researched the hashtag blessed on Instagram, and I just took notice of what began to pop up, and then I compared it to the list of blessings that Jesus pronounces here in Matthew chapter 5. And can I just tell you, they are two very different lists. The Beatitudes and the blessings of Instagram read, blessed are those who got the keys to their new home. Blessed. <laughs> Little Fred Hammond for you. Blessed. Blessed are those who have the perfect body and a six-pack. Blessed. That one really got me. I got a two-pack Shakur, and it's just, it's just struggling. It's just struggling. Just struggling. It has not been seen since 96. <laughs> Pac is like, it's with, it's with me, my brother. Resting in paradise. Blessed are those who found the perfect soulmate. Blessed are those who have the money and the means to travel around the world. Blessed are those who drive Range Rovers and nice cars. Blessed are those who have the house in the hills and the infinity pools. Blessed are those who are physically attractive. Blessed are those who have the picture-perfect family. That's Instagram's Beatitudes. And they're very different from Jesus' Beatitudes. The way we see the world is very different than the, way we, than the way God sees it. 
And can I just submit to you, that's not just Instagram's Beatitudes. Those are all of our Beatitudes in this room. And I know it because I saw some of your profiles pop up when I looked on the... <laughs> I'm just being serious. I'm just being serious. <laughs> I've been waiting to say this all week, but don't be having an attitude when your Beatitudes don't match Jesus' Beatitudes. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> That was fire when it was in my mind. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to move on. We don't see the world the same way that God sees it, and that's dangerous. Because each of us in this room have a unique purpose, a unique calling, a unique gifting, and a unique assignment that God has called for us to do in this earth. And we're uniquely gifted and called to do it. And nobody can do it quite like you do it. But if you see the world differently than your God does, you will spend your entire life devoted to hitting targets, to hitting bullseyes that are on the wrong targets. We'll never fulfill our purpose, and we'll never live the life that God has called and imagined us to live. Each of us has a calling in this room, a unique calling. And all a calling is, it's just a fancy Christian word. A calling is, write this down, a calling is something on the inside of you that won't quit even if you do. Think Moana. I've been standing at the edge of the water long as I can remember. Y'all supposed to finish. <laughs> My son is really into Moana right now. I've seen it 16 times in the last day. So the first thing we have to do, if we're going to show up and live in this world the way that God has called us to show up and live in this world, the first thing we have to do is see this world the same way that God sees the world. So Jesus begins to administer this spiritual vision alignment, this spiritual vision adjustment. And the first thing he says when he adjusts our vision of how we see the world and who we think is important and who we think is blessed, the first thing that Jesus says is, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That won't make it on Instagram's Beatitudes, but it's on Jesus' list. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That won't make it on Facebook's Beatitudes list, but it's on Jesus' list. And then today he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Meek, 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 meek. It's a word that, honestly, if I'm just keeping it real, I have not used it all year until I was prepared for this sermon. Like, it's kind of like almost like a useless word. Like, we don't think about the word meek. If I'm honest, the first thing I think of when I hear the word meek is I think of the rapper Meek Mills, you know? Anybody know Meek Mills? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's the first thing I think of. That was 12 of us in the room. I love it. It's okay, though. Just Google it. Not right now, because I'm still talking, but just Google it later. But meekness is an underused word, and then... Even if we've heard it before, it's an underused word, and it's a really misunderstood word. But Jesus seems to think it's really important. Jesus seems to think it's really important. Like, there are so many words and so many things that Jesus could have brought up in the introduction to this sermon, but he uses meekness. So if Jesus thinks it's this important, we need to understand what it means. And before we understand what meekness is, we first need to take a pit stop and understand what meekness is not. Meekness is not a personality trait. Meekness is not a personality trait. Write that one down. Meekness is not a personality trait. For some of us in this room, you might be thinking, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too chic to be meek. I'm too fierce to be meek. Meekness, that don't even sound like me. I'm too much of a man to be meek. Oh, but that's not true because meekness is not a personality trait that you either have or don't have, like extroversion and introversion. Like my wife is an introvert. She will never do this. She's not going to stand up on a stage and speak a word, or maybe she will. Who knows? I'm not going to limit what God wants to do in her life. I'm sorry, boo. I'll text her about that later. But my wife, is, she's just not like, you know, trying to hang out with a bunch of people. But my wife is amazing one-on-one. -on -one. She will sit with you, listen to you, encourage you, and speak a word over coffee in a coffee shop that has no more than six people in it because she's just introverted. That's just the way she is. She's never going to be extroverted. Meekness is not a personality trait in the way that extroversion and introversion is a personality trait. And the second thing is, meekness is also not weakness. Meekness is not 
weakness. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that little rhyme, uh, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, right? And if you look up meek in the urban dictionary or meek in, in just the dictionary, you'll see it, it says something like this. It says weak, submissive, easily imposed upon. Anybody want to be that? Nobody want to be that, right? And I don't think that's what the Word of God calls us to, because I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible says he has not given us a spirit of fear or a spirit of timidity, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So meekness is not weakness, and meekness is not a personality trait. And that's all I got, because I was really struggling to define it. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I got a couple of things. The first thing that meekness is, is meekness is a character trait. Meekness is not a personality trait, but meekness is a character trait. Meekness is a character trait in the same way that patience is a character trait. It can be leaned into, it can be encouraged, it can be developed, and you can be more meek today than you were yesterday. You can be more meek next month than you were this month. Meekness is not a personality trait, but it is a character trait that can be developed, that can be encouraged, spurred on, and grown in the life of a follower of Jesus. As you look throughout the New Testament, the word is used uh, about two or three times. It's used in Peter, it's used here by Jesus, and then Jesus uses it one more time to describe himself. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and I will give you rest for I am meek and humble at heart. So meekness is a character trait, and Jesus uses it to describe himself. So when you look at the New Testament, what you see is that meekness means power under control. Power and strength that is under control. Meekness is this power and strength that is under control. It's power that uses its power and strength to bless and not to curse. It's power that uses its power and strength to protect and not harm. It's power that uses its power and strength to bring peace and not to make war. It's this power and strength that uses that power and strength to protect those that are vulnerable. Meekness is this power that is under control. The third thing, or the second thing that meekness is, it's a character trait, but then the second thing that meekness is, and this kind of messed with me a little bit, but meekness is a social condition. Meekness is a social condition, and that's the way that Jesus is using the word here when he says, blessed are the meek. Meek very, is a very similar word to the word poor here in Matthew 5. It's very similar in the way that Jesus is using it. And some scholars and theologians even say that, 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 that Jesus is just repeating himself in the third line when he says, blessed are the meek, in the same way that he's saying, blessed are the poor. So meek, and especially when you look throughout the Old Testament, it's a social condition. Jesus is saying, blessed are those of you who have been made meek by society. Blessed are those of you who have been pushed into a position of weakness. Blessed are those of you who have been oppressed, who have been shoved to the margins. Blessed are those of you who have been forgotten about by society. And think about who Jesus is even talking to. The crowds that have come to gather are all those with various diseases, folks who were paralyzed, folks who were possessed by demons, folks who are struggling with seizures. All these different people who were struggling with chronic pain, and those are all people who would have been pushed to the margins of society and who very likely would have been poor because their physical condition didn't put them in a position where they could work and earn a living. So Jesus is saying, blessed are you who for society has pushed you into a position of meekness. If you don't believe me, let's believe God's word because Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 37 when he says that. Jesus is alluding directly to Psalm 37, starting in verse 10. I'll just read it, or verse 9. This is what Jesus is alluding to. It says, for those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So Jesus is saying, blessed are those of you who suffer injustice and who are pushed to the margins because God is on your side. 
And I love it. He says, the meek will inherit the land. The meek will inherit the land. It's this passive receiving something that God is going to do on the behalf of those for whom society has made them meek. Jesus says, the meek will inherit the land. I love that because right now there are a whole bunch of people who are in possession of the land. But Jesus says, oh, those who are in possession of the land today won't necessarily be the same ones who will inherit the land when it's all said and done. So don't you dare as a follower of Jesus. Jesus, turn your heart and turn your eyes towards possessing the land because Jesus says it's not about the ones who possess and own and dominate the land right now, but Jesus says the meek will inherit the land when the kingdom has come in its fullness. So don't you dare position your life and position your aspirations and position yourself towards possessing and hoarding and holding as much as you can get because Jesus says it won't be like that in the end of all things. Meekness is a character trait, and meekness is also this social condition. So when you look at the full range of the biblical narrative, here's what I think meekness is saying. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. And this is the Mark Chase interpretation, so just roll with me on this one. But it's almost as if Jesus is saying, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. But it's almost as if Jesus is saying, blessed are those who suffer injustice for the Lord is on their side, and blessed are those who use their power and strength to not perpetuate injustice, but to oppose it instead. That's the full range of the biblical definition of meekness. I'll say it one more time. Blessed are those who suffer injustice, for the Lord is on your side, and blessed are those who use their power and strength to not perpetuate an injustice, but to oppose it instead. Blessed are those who surrender their power for the powerless, and blessed are the powerless, for the Lord is on your side. That's meekness. We could give God a praise for that. I worked very hard. (laughs) That's what meekness is. And it's something that we are all called to as followers of Jesus. But can I just tell you what the biggest obstacle to meekness is? I want to just talk about this. We're going to park here for about five minutes. Here it is. Write this word down. The biggest obstacle to meekness in the life of the follower of Jesus is one word, power. Power. Power is the biggest obstacle to meekness. And as I mentioned, meekness is really, really important because Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are meek because they're going to be the ones who are around when this is all said and done. It's not about who's winning and who's victorious right now. Jesus says when it's all said and done, the folks who are victorious, the folks who are around, the folks who will see the coming kingdom of God, the folks who will inherit the earth are those who are meek. So we better understand it and we better embrace it and live into it because Jesus seems to think this is what the world will look like when his kingdom reigns in its fullness. The biggest obstacle to becoming meek is power. And all power is, whether it's money, whether it's your cultural influence, whether it's political power, all power is is just represented in options. If you got options, you got power. (laughs) So all of us in this room have a little bit of power, some of us more than others, but power is just about having options. But as followers of Jesus, we are never called and we are never instructed to hold and to hoard power. We're always instructed, though, to surrender and relinquish power. Oh, I could tell y'all don't believe me. Well, at least believe the Bible. Hear this scene. Jesus has two disciples. Two of Jesus' disciples come up to him, uh, and they ask. And I think it's the, 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 the brothers uh, who were brothers. I'm forgetting their names right now. I think it was Thomas and, and somebody else. Any other biblical scholars in the room just shout it out? Yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Yeah making me look like I know what I'm doing. Thank you, Pastor Christine. But they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, which one of us will sit at your right hand and at your left hand? 
In other words, Jesus, which one of us is going to be the most powerful? Which one of us is going to have the most pull? Which one of us is going to have the most authority? Which one of us is going to have the most influence? And Jesus says, it's not about who's sitting at my right hand or who's sitting at my left hand. You should not grasp for power. It's not about sitting at my right or sitting at my left. It's not about having authority, influence, and power, but it's about service. And he says, you need to run away from that power. And then Jesus himself says, or Jesus himself, in 1 Timothy, it says that he didn't think it was robbery to be called equal with God, but he emptied himself. He relinquished his power when he came in the flesh. So as followers of Jesus, our relationship to power should always be one where as soon as we get it, we're trying to relinquish it and surrender it for the kingdom of God as fast as we can. For followers of Jesus, our relationship to power should be like this power strip. Our relationship to power should be like this power strip. As soon as power comes into this thing, it relinquishes it and gives it away. As soon as power comes into this thing, it surrenders it and it gives it away. And as it gives away power, it blesses every single thing that it comes in contact with. As followers of Jesus, our relationship to power should be one in which when we get power, we don't hoard it and try to hold on to it, but we relinquish it and surrender it and give it away as generously and as quickly as possible because it'll bless others and build up the kingdom of God. Our relationship to power should be like this power strip. And can I just tell you, these things got a long shelf life. I've, I know I got some extension cords that I've used that have been around since the 80s. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand, just blink. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It might be time to change it. These got a long life. But for some of us, as followers of Jesus, the temptation, because of the American dream, what the temptation is, is instead of being a power strip, we become more like a battery. And when power comes into our hands, when we get some money, when we get some influence, when we get that promotion, when we get some authority, so we just want to hoard it and we just want to store it up. And as soon as we get some power, the next thing we want is what? Some more power. But can I just tell you that as a follower of Jesus, we are never called to hoard and to store up power. And anything and anyone who begins to store up power, as soon as we begin and as soon as we start to do that, we are on our way to death. This battery doesn't have a shelf life that's very, very long. In a few months, this thing is going to be done. And as soon as we begin to hold and hoard onto power, we become like a battery and not like a power strip. And batteries have a very short shelf life and are destined for death. Again, if you don't believe me, at least believe the Bible. Jesus says it this way. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. In other words, I am the power and you are the power strip. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you're just a battery with a shelf life that isn't very long. But if you abide in me, That just rolled all the way to, I know the Lord is talking to you, Brother Romaine. <laughs> that, just, that just rolled all the way. <laughs> that just kept going. <laughs> Prophetic witness. <laughs> the biggest enemy to power, or the biggest enemy to meekness, is power. Where in your life are the places where, if you're honest, you're either hoarding and holding on to as much power as you can, or you're grasping and in reaching for as much power as you can. For some of us, it's our money, and it's our bank account. If I could just get some more money. And that's why the Bible is is dead on when it says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Some translations tinker with it and change it a little bit, and they say the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But no, 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 I think the Bible had it right the first time. It's the love of money is the root of all evil because all money is, all it does is it represents power. The love of power, the lust for power, is where evil comes from. The lust for power is where sexism comes from. The lust for power is where racism comes from. The lust for power is where classism comes from. The lust for power is where every single ism in this world originates. So let's make some categories and tell people who has power and who doesn't. Where in your life are you grasping and reaching for power, and where in your life are you holding and hoarding power? 
For some of us, it's our money. For some of us, it's political power. The election is coming back up in 2020, and we are doubling down on our political parties. We are doubling down on our political jargon because we are hoarding and holding on to the power, and we're scared somebody's going to take our power. So we need to come together, and we need to worry as a community and secure our power and keep other people from having power. So come 2020, a lot of us are going to head out to the polls, and all we're doing is doubling down on our power. Amen, lights. That was a tight one. That was a tight one. It's tight because I tried it on myself before I came here, and it was tight in the car. For some of us, it's cultural influence. We're grasping after cultural influence. And for some of us, we're spending more time trying to build up our followers on Instagram and Facebook than we are being built up as a follower of Jesus and spending our time with our face in his book. Where are the places in your life where you're either hoarding or grasping for power? It isn't a long shelf life. When you possess, you only possess for this moment. You don't possess for eternity. It isn't a long shelf life. And so, if the greatest enemy to meekness is power... What's the greatest friend to meekness, Chase? I'm so glad you asked that question. If the greatest enemy to meekness is power, the greatest friend to meekness is service. I'll say that one more time. If the greatest enemy to to meekness is power, the greatest friend to meekness is service. Jesus said to his disciples, James and John, it's not about power. It's not about where you sit. It's not about holding and hoarding authority. But the greatest among you is the one who does what? Serves. The greatest among you is the one who serves. And Jesus Christ said it this way. When he came into this world, one of the first things he told his disciples was this. And write this down. He says, the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. The Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. And one of the ways that we serve is we relinquish our power as soon as we touch it. As Christians, we are not called to hold power. We are not called to hold power. That's empire. We're called the empower. That's kingdom. I'm going to say that one more time. As Christians, we're never called to hold power. That's empire. We're called to empower, that's kingdom. And the way that we empower is by serving. It's by serving. So what would it look like for you to show up in meekness in your family? Instead of showing up in the house, and, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself on this one, you, you, you come home and you're looking around for how can I be served? <laughs> like how can I, yeah, I want, I want to do what I want to do. How can I be served? That's, that's empire when it's all about you. But instead, what would it look like for you to show up this week in your family as soon as you step into the house, you think, how can I be of service? How can I give something away? How can I serve? And Dr. Martin Luther King says it this way. He says, the mark and the character of a person is how they treat someone who can do nothing for them. You know why this is so important? You know why people get pushed to the margins? Because when we look at them, we think there's no way they can serve me. And so we forget about them. And so we push them to the margins. Because there's no way that they can serve us unless they're under us. The greatest among us is those who would serve. What would it look like instead of driving through communities, instead of just living and residing in a community because it's just a cool, nice, hip, happening part of town, what would it look like to ask a different question and instead of saying, man, how many cool places to eat are in this city? How many cool places to go for ice cream are in this city? How many cool artisanal mayonnaise spots are there in this city? What would it look like? Oh, that hit somebody. <laughs> what would it look like to say, Instead of thinking and asking, how can this community serve me, what would it look like to show up and say, how can I serve this community? The greatest among you is the one who serves. I love it. 
Because Jesus, I, I love the heart of God. Because as I look at these Beatitudes, and I think to myself, like, my goodness, like, like, you know, unless I'm listening to Meek Mills in the car, you know, meekness is something that's so difficult for me to embody and, and live by. It's just something that's, that's, that's so hard and so difficult to do. Um, it's not something that I nail every single day. It's not a, a kingdom value that I live into every single day. It's not something that I embody all the time. But, but, but I love uh, the Beatitudes because as you read the Beatitudes, one of the things that you notice is that Jesus Christ fulfills every single Beatitude. I love it. Jesus fulfills every single one because as we read this list, we see that it applies to Jesus in every single way. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who was more poor than Jesus? He came out of heaven and he came out of eternity, but he didn't come out of heaven and come out of eternity in the form of a conquering king. He came out of heaven and he came into a eternity as a little baby and he was born in a manger because they couldn't find room in a hotel and he was born in a poor district and he lived as a marginalized person under Roman occupation who was more poor than Jesus Christ blessed are those who mourn who mourn more than Jesus as he bled and he hung and died on a cross for the first time in his entire existence all he had experienced was intimacy with his heavenly father and there on the cross he experienced this separation from God that must have felt incredibly horrific to the depths we can't even imagine. Who mourn more than Jesus? Blessed are the meek. Who is more meek than Jesus? Coming in the form of a baby. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who hungered and thirsted for righteousness more than Jesus? Even up until the point of the cross where he cried out that he was thirsty and the Roman soldiers gave him something to drink. But Jesus wasn't just physically thirsty. He was hungering and thirsting for our righteousness and he was so thirsty for our righteousness that he allowed the blood to stream down that he allowed a crown of thorns to be put around his head that he allowed nails to be put into his hands and he allowed nails to be put into his feet because he hungered and thirsted for our righteousness the thing that I love about the Beatitudes is that Jesus says I'll go first I'm calling you to it but my son, my daughter, I'll go first. And not only will I go first, but I'm going to give you my spirit so you can go next. Jesus didn't go first just to be our example. Jesus went first and then gave us his spirit so that we could then do likewise. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the ones who have room for God to do something in their life. Blessed are the ones whose hands are empty. Now you see why Jesus said, blessed are the meek? <laughs> blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, because they don't have to make that choice. <laughs> My hands are empty, and I have room for God to do what only God can do. But where are the places in your life where the resurrection power of God has no room to work because you're hoarding and holding on to the power of this world. Because I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible says this, that he hung and he bled and he died on Friday night, and he spent Friday night in the tomb, and all day Saturday he was in the tomb. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. So the power of this world must be an illusion if all the power is hidden in the hands of Jesus. But where are the places in your life where the resurrection and power of God can't do the work that it's come to do because you're holding on to the illusionary power of this world. Jesus says, I'll go first. I'll surrender my power for your righteousness. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the ones who have room and create room for God to do what only God can do for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>